Thanks, everyone. So I'm here to talk about uh, the internet and how I wish it was more fun. And the reason I've been thinking about this is I think back to the 90s. Anyone else grew up in the 90s? <laughs> awesome. I recently tried watching Rocco's Modern Life, and it is like an extremely strange show, uh, which maybe accounts for why our generation is so strange. Um, here I am in the 90s using a computer. I'm wearing a Cartman shirt. Uh, I'm not even going to try to justify that. <laughs> But this is what the internet looked like, right? GeoCities. Everything was perpetually under construction. You discovered new content via WebRing. And what I think was so magical about this time period is that everyone always really tried to make their sites like really whimsical and fun and themed, right? There, I recently discovered this archive called webdesignmuseum.org, which is just a series of websites from the late 90s, early 2000s. It's so much fun. I highly recommend it. And I think one of my favorite websites from this period is McDonald's. This is McDonald's's actual website, circa November 1997. What I like about it is if we zoom in, there's a little guy who pops out to like polish the arches. It's amazing. By contrast, if we go to McDonald's.com now, this is what we see. <laughs> like this isn't great. Um, it's still loading tracking scripts in the background. Uh, but so once you get rid of all that, like, as much as uh, I might dislike that initial experience, this actually is a better web product, right? You see photos of the food, that's new. Um, you can order it, like, McDelivery. They'll bring the McDonald's into your house. Uh, you can find the nearest location, look at the menu. So it's, like, better in the sense that there's more things you can do, but it's a bit of a regression in one critical way. And that's that it's not fun, it's bland, it's corporate, it's what it needs to be and nothing else. They're focusing on efficiency rather than, like, making the experience joyful. And I think that's kind of a shame. So this talk is called The Case for Whimsy. Um, it's really just about uh, like how we can make our experiences better. Uh, and yeah, this, incidentally, is the extended mix. Um, because I gave a similar talk at React Europe this year. Uh, but that talk was only 25 minutes. And you have to listen to me speak for 3 quarters of an hour now. So more stuff. So I'm going to use the term whimsy quite a bit. Um, and here's a definition that I made up, an unexpected flourish that sparks joy. And I like this definition, right? It focuses on the fact that it's like this delightful surprise. And I think the best example for this, uh, because it's a really broad definition, uh, but a good example of this, not the best, but a good one, is error pages. Because errors are like intrinsically frustrating, right? You get an error, it's not fun. Uh, but some places try to like at least make you smile. And one of my favorite examples is Unsplash. So when you get an error on Unsplash, they have these <laughs> they have these gifs of just things going poorly for people. <laughs> and it like totally transforms the experience of getting a 500 error. Um, but that's not like that's fun, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'd like to focus on animation and interaction. And I think the reason for this focus is that this is, the this is like the space that we have to make a difference in the experience. Right? The difference between like a newspaper or a magazine and like a modern web product is that you can interact with it and you can have animations. So that's what I'd like to focus on. So let's look at an example. Loading indicators. Um, so I think we have to like a little bit of history, right? In the olden days of the web, when you had Netscape Navigator, um, the entirety of the loading experience was handled by the browser. Because you go to a URL, and like, you're just waiting for that round trip. It has to fetch the document, return the document. The document, once it's back, is like fully loaded and ready to go. And the way that you knew that the browser was working was you had this like meteor shower, like this N in the corner over here, would have this like neat little effect, like this little animation. And I think that's actually, like, for most of the internet, that's still how it works. When I click on a news article, like you'll see in the corner, there's like a little spinner that the browser is working on. And then the site comes like almost fully loaded. Uh, there's, this is like a real ad. Apparently, monetizing my cat is a good idea. <laughs> this is the future we're living in. It's really stupid. Um, but yeah, like there was no real, like the news article had no loading indicator. The browser controlled the fact that it was loading. And I think like as most of us in this room, build single page applications, we've like inherited this problem of how do we show the user that things are loading? And like sometimes you'll see like there's, oh, this has their logo on it. But we're really not taking advantage of the fact that 
Like the internet spinner has to work for every web product, website, web app on the internet. Uh, but we, like, we can customize ours for what we're doing. And a lot of the time, we've just kind of like taken what the browser was doing and replicated it, which I feel is a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, you know, like when you load notifications, it's just a spinner. Why is it just a spinner? I work at Khan Academy. I neglected to mention that earlier. Um, Khan Academy is an online learning platform. We're a nonprofit. Uh, our goal is really to provide a free, world-class education for anyone, anywhere. Um, and we have kind of fallen into the same trap where we have a loading spinner. Uh, it's not great. Uh, we recently unveiled a new logo, though. And over the summer, we had a team of interns working to see if we could create a loading indicator that was more custom for us. So they have a few examples. This one is all kind of based around this idea of rotation. This one has this like neat little wobble effect. This one I feel is domain specific. It's like drawing and erasing itself. And then like the crowd favorite is this sprouting animation, which is pretty nice. All of these were just done by a team of three interns. Uh, amazing work. It's all just CSS transitions with a bit of SVG filtering. Um, so really cool work. Uh, and I was thinking about this. Uh, I started working on a project called Guppy recently. And Guppy is really just a tool to help new developers get started learning React without all of the like cruft that you have to know, all the chores. So the idea is that like it helps you launch a dev server and build for production, run tests. It's a desktop application you download it, you can manage dependencies. Because it's like kind of strange to me that when someone wants to learn how to build with React development, if you want to use something like Create React App or if you want to use NPM, you have to know how a terminal works. And terminal skills are undeniably valuable, but are they really the first thing you need to learn? Like, are, should it be blocking? So I've been working on this tool. Incidentally, it's open source, community driven. If anyone wants to come help me build this, more than uh, happy to welcome you. Um, but we had a problem with this. And let's just like, see if we could spot the problem. So this is what onboarding looks like. We first have to create a project. So after spending probably too long coming up with a good name, uh, we select a project type. Vanilla React actually just delegates to create React app. And then it has to build. So the first couple steps are fast. Uh, and then it has to install dependencies. And it takes a while. Um, it's not really something that Guppy has much control over because it's just delegating to the tool. It's still going, right? Like, not done yet. Almost there, come on, there we go. Okay, um, so that's not great. This is the first thing someone sees when they start using the application. And I started thinking about like, how can I improve this? Because actually making it faster isn't really within my control. And it's, I don't mean to put the blame on the tools that I'm using because Create React App just uses NPM. And it just has to download a whole bunch of dependencies and link them and set them up. And it just takes a while, it's unavoidable. Um, and again, I started thinking back to like the days of old, right? Remember this screen, anyone? <laughs> The old Internet Explorer, you had this planet and this folder, and the, the files would kind of flutter around. And so I thought, why don't I use, uh, why don't I take inspiration from this? So this is what the new installation looks like, or the new project creation. We have the planet, <laughs> we have the folder. But, but, it's interactive. So you can actually like grab a file and drag it around the screen. <laughs> Throw it off in a direction and watch as it spirals gravity free. There's even like you can make up your own mini game, like try to throw it in the folder and it'll like gobble it up. Um, and just like that, we're done. And it's, it's the same amount of time. It's still the 30 to 40 seconds, which is like a long time, but it goes a lot faster. And I think that this is like, like we hear so much about performance and why performance is important. One second of load lag time would cost Amazon $1.6 billion in sales per year. And like this is true, and I, like, I'm not debating this. This is like absolutely like performance is super important. But I think these quotes are slightly misleading because they imply that the actual like sitting with a stopwatch is the most important thing. Uh, and it makes it seem like a four and a half second load time is always worse than a five second load time. And that's not true, right? It matters what the experience is like. So perceived performance is really important. And it's actually more like perceived experience. Because if you're just sitting and staring at a spinner for five seconds, that's no fun. But if you give the user something to do, it's a lot better. Okay, so I thought I'd uh, dig into some of the code. Uh, but before doing that, I thought it'd be fun to like, just look with the Chrome inspector to see how this works. So let's see if we can figure this out. So I have this planet, um, and there's a few things that I'm just gonna get rid of. Like there's this SVG that just it adds gradients. We don't need that. The moon is actually just, if you Google CSS cube, you can figure out how to make this. Um, it was one of those like, I just followed the tutorial and it worked. Um, but there's one cool CSS property. Has anyone ever heard of transform style as a CSS property? It's what allows this cool like, 
the planet moves behind the thing. And I thought that was impossible, because that's like a 3D engine kind of thing. If I disable it, you'll see that because the, the Z index is in front of it, it like breaks this illusion. But this cool like preserve 3D means that if you just apply a CSS rotation, like transform rotate, it'll actually like respect the fact that this rotation pushes it behind another object, which is really cool. Um, but let's get rid of that for now too. And Earth has no rings, so we don't need that. Um, I'm gonna get rid of a couple of the cloud layers. And so this cloud animation, it's just moving from left to right. And if I highlight this, you'll see that this is what it's doing. Um, it takes a while, because you know the, the Earth takes a while to spin clouds. Um, and the Earth contents are kind of doing the same thing. They're just moving from left to right. And I use the Web Animation API for this, but it's actually like a pretty, um, like it's not a, a terribly complicated animation. Uh, incidentally, right, um, you may think that this is like the kind of resource you need a designer for, um, but you don't, because this is the design for my continents. I did it in like five minutes, and it's objectively bad. Like this is not what our planet looks like. But you put like enough layers, right, and it looks okay. Uh, undeniably, it would look better with a real designer, but don't let the fact that we may not have the best design skills stop us from trying stuff like this, because some animation can hide a lot of mistakes. Okay, so I'd like to look at a component. Um, rotate around planet is not the like moon rotating, it's the like, I couldn't come up with a very good name for it, but it's the like clouds and the continents, it's the rotation of the planet. And I thought we could look into it. So it has some props, it needs to know how big the planet is, it has some animation props like duration and delay, and then children is just like the actual thing being rotated. Because I use this both for the clouds and for the continents, so it's generic so I can reuse it. Um, it's gonna have a default duration of 50 seconds, which sounds like a lot, but you know, Planets are slow. Our render method is just, we're rendering the children that you pass it and we're wrapping it in a div just so that we can capture a reference to it. When the component mounts, grab some stuff out of props. This looks a little familiar maybe. Um, so this is the Web Animations API. And it actually works very, very similar to a CSS keyframes animation. So this is one frame and I'm saying, okay, let's start with the translate X being negative 100%. Something kind of cool about CSS transform is that percentages unlike everything else in CSS, aren't relative to the parent, it's relative to the child. So if our child is 60 pixels wide, negative 100% is the same as saying negative 60 pixels. So it's offsetting, like if our planet is here, it's offsetting the children so that it's at the very, very edge so that it's just about to start. Um, and we wanna go to, like the next keyframe, is to positive whatever the planet size is. So we're going from negative 100% of the child to positive whatever the planet size is. It's cool that you can mix like this is a percent and this is a pixel, but it works. Um, I also have like some timing configuration. This is also just part of Web Animations API. So you specify how long you want it to take if there's a delay. And because the planet continues to spin, it has infinity iterations. And then this is like the, the, the key method, right? All HTML nodes in a Web Animations API compatible browser will have this animate property. And then you just pass it the keyframes, the first argument, and the timing as the second. And that's like all there is to it. Um, so that's neat. Web Animations API does not have great browser support. Um, it works like the, everything I just showed will work fine in Firefox and Chrome, uh, but not at all in Edge or Safari. But there is a polyfill, so if you do wanna use it, you can, I mean, you can also just use CSS keyframe animations. Uh, probably works better in a lot of cases. Uh, water. Okay, so another thing I wanna look at is the fact that files, in this case, are like the projectile, the thing moving. Uh, they rotate, and so like as I move it around, you'll notice the file is always pointing in the direction that it's traveling. And this was like kind of a cool effect, so I thought we could look into it. So I have a projectile component, uh, which can take any kind of child and will make it a projectile. Crucially, it doesn't manage its own position. It's trusting the parent for that, so it receives an XY coordinate as props. I'm storing a reference to where it was previously, and of course, for the very first, uh, when it's mounted, we don't have a previous coordinate. When the component updates, I can update the previous coordinate with the fact that component did update and gets the previous props. And what this means is that for every render cycle, other than the very first, which here we're accounting for, um, we always know where it was the last frame and where it is now. And so we can use that to get the delta. And like if we think back to trigonometry and high school, um, you may remember that if you get like, if the delta x is let's say four pixels and the delta y is one pixel, you can make a right angle triangle out of that and then you can use the power of trigonometry to work out what the angle is. Here I'm using math.atan2, um, which is the arc tangent, and two uh, solves some of the problems related to quadrants for us. Um, again, I'm not, like truthfully, I don't remember that much of my high school trigonometry, but this method apparently solves a lot of things for us, so that's cool. Um, and then in our render method, we're just grabbing stuff out of props, coming up with the rotation. 
our div is going to receive, uh, like we're going to position it absolutely and then use the coordinates that are passed to it. And then our transform is just going to rotate it. And the other thing is too is that this method um, returns things in radians. Uh, and I didn't know that CSS transforms accepted radians as a unit, but they do. So we can skip having to do the conversion to degrees. And then we just render whatever our children are. So that's kind of like it was less code than I expected, um, but it's imperfect. And you'll notice when I'm moving slowly, it's kind of like herky-jerky, like it's not, it doesn't feel smooth. And when I release it, I mean, it's probably really hard to tell uh, the scale, but it's a little bit, like it's not as smooth as it could be because it's still working on a pixel by pixel basis. So there's a couple things we can do to improve it. Um, this is the version two, same props. Um, instead of just storing the previous coordinate, we're storing an array of coordinates. And then when the component updates, we're gonna push the coordinate that it was most recently onto this array. Um, the array is actually a queue though, it's a first in first out queue. And we're making sure that it has a maximum length of eight items. And so what this means is that when the ninth item comes in, we shift off the oldest one. So we have this moving window of the most recent eight coordinates. In our get file rotation, this is still just the same check to make sure that our first render returns zero. Um, incidentally, if you're wondering why it's zero, uh, it actually doesn't matter what I return because the file starts being hidden by the planet. Um, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, and then this is interesting. Um, I'm taking the first coordinate, which is the oldest coordinate that I have access to up to eight ticks ago. And that's what I'm using for the delta. And the reason I'm doing that is because it really like it smooths out the, 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 del the delta because when I'm doing the most recent one, realistically the mouse is only gonna move a few pixels in every tick because this is updating really quickly. But when you have a bit of a more of a window, you can really smooth out how it turns. So if I check it out now, like you'll notice I have all this like nice motion. It's no longer jerky. So that's a win. Um, the other thing I'm doing is in our render method, I'm positioning it absolutely still, but I'm setting it to zero, zero. So the file is always gonna be in the very top left corner. And then I'm using transform translate to actually move it. Uh, that in combination with will change transform means that this animation now happens on the video card. So not only is it smoother, but we can take advantage of subpixel rendering. So it's just gonna be compositing this thing around on the video card. And that means, I mean, it's really hard to tell at the scale, but it does look a lot smoother. I have to take my word on that for now. Okay, so this is a fun example, I think, it's neat. Um, but you may be wondering, like, is this relevant? Is this something you can use in your day-to-day -day life? And I think probably, maybe, I'm actually just curious for my own interest. How many people work on side projects outside of work? Okay, that's like almost everyone. Um, so, you know, when you're working on a side project, often you don't have a designer. So immediately, like, this is now something under your purview. And I think it's really worth spending a bit of time on. So I think it's definitely relevant for people who work on side projects. But even for people who don't, I think there's value in this. And the reason I think that is that, like, I've been part of interactions, and I've seen plenty of interactions, where a design or product will have some kind of idea. And the response from the engineer is that, like, yeah, we could do that, but it's non-trivial, right? Anyone use that term, non-trivial? Um, what if we could make the universe of what is trivial bigger? Because if you know how to do this kind of stuff, then it is trivial. So uh, it really opens up what we can do as engineers, as front end engineers working with design. So uh, maybe the actual example we've shown isn't the most relevant, but the skills you learn building examples like this are. And to look at maybe a more relevant example, let's look at an email client, right? This is more like businessy. Go do a demo, Josh, okay. So I have this email client. Um, I have this list of emails on the left. This is actually written by Ken Wheeler. Um, so that's something. Um, I can compose an email. So I might say, I don't know, someone, hello, yo. I can click send and then it'll fold itself up and shoot itself off. Um, there's sound too, which is neat. Um, there's a few things I wanna talk about with this demo. Um, the first is that I wanna make the point that animation works best in cases like this when you're focusing not on simple state changes, but based on what the user is doing. And what I mean by that is that when I click on this button, like the way we often think about state with React is that your UI is a function of state, right? That's the expression. Yeah, it actually is an expression. Um, but the thing is, let's say our state here is a Boolean. We have an is open Boolean for a modal. So when it goes from false to true, we do that pop out thing. When it goes from true to false, we do that. But this whole business, right, sending it, that's also an email close animation. So if we're just animating based on that state, we only have two possible animations, whereas this we have quite a few. Um, the save draft has a different animation that we'll look at shortly. I mean, it's very similar, but different still. So we need to be focusing more on actually 
like what the user is doing. So instead of a modal open animation, this is a start composing email mode uh, animation, or like a dismiss email modal animation, or a send email animation. And the reason this is beneficial is that it communicates what happened to the user. So if I'm sending my email, and then I accidentally like click over here, if I just miss the button, I don't know if I've sent it or not. There's easily like, this has happened to me on Twitter before, like I think I'll dismiss a tweet, but it'll actually send it somehow, and that's disorienting. Um, but there's no way to confuse, if like the standard modal animation would just be for it to fade away or something, we wouldn't have any indication as to what was actually happening. Um, incidentally, this is not my idea. Um, there's this wonderful blog post uh, called Meaningful Motion with Action Driven Animation by Tobias Allen. Highly recommend it because it goes into this idea in a lot more detail. Um, another thing I wanna focus on before I go back to the presentation is letting, and this is like similar but slightly different, is using animation as a way to communicate how to use the application to the user. So this has happened to me, right? Where you're, let's say you're working on like a WordPress theme or Medium or anything, and you save a draft. So you're writing and then you're not happy with it or you're not finished, so you click save. Um, normally, you don't actually know where that save goes. Like in this case, the UI is pretty simple. So you could probably find the drafts tab pretty quickly and there it is. But that's not always the case in a more complicated UI. And so this gets at like a bigger problem of how do we get users to learn how to use our applications? And I think the common way that we do that is through like the onboarding tour, right? So you sign up for a new thing and then it's like, take the tour and you say, okay. And then the screen darkens and a spotlight shows up. And it's like, this is how you send an email. And you realize then that it says, this is tooltip one out of 47. And like, nobody likes these things. You click escape, you get out of it. And then as a result, you don't learn how to use it. And so you wind up being frustrated when you realize that you have no idea where your saved email lives. Like, this has happened to me in a bunch of applications. I still don't know where a draft tweet goes. Um, so, but the reason this is better is that when I click sa save, like it actually moves across the screen and it takes your eye on a journey to that area. So there's no way to miss that. So that's convenient. Okay. The third thing I wanna talk about is this folding animation. Um, and unlike the previous two points, I don't have like rationale for why this is good, other than it makes me smile, and I like smiling. Because um, it's fun, right? It folds, and then it has this like airmail strip, and um, so that's cool. Um, but there is a criticism of this, and it, it's especially obvious when it's slowed down like this, which is that this is like a, even in its best case, it's like a two second long animation, which is like really long, right? There's this webcomic. I thought it was cute the first time, but by the 70th, it's annoying. Um, credit to Rachel Neighbors for this brilliant little cartoon. Um, and I absolutely agree with this. But I think we miss the mark when we think that the solution is that we just shouldn't have nice things. Um, you know, we're developers. Why don't we use local storage to keep track of how many emails we've sent? And then, like, this isn't a hard programming problem. Whenever we're sending an email, we get the number that we've currently sent, and then our animation style is gonna depend on that. So if we've sent more than three, we'll opt for a speedy variant. And if we've sent less than three, we get the, like, full fat, the, like, nice experience. Um, so that's not a hard problem. And like the speedy variant in this case, it could just happen a lot faster. Um, it could skip the folding and just do the moving. It could actually just go back to just fading out in the way that everything else works. And it's okay in that case because we've already taught the user how to use the application and we've already made them smile with this folding thing. I think that like, don't forget in my definition, whimsy is supposed to be unexpected. And so like if you've seen it 70 times, that's not unexpected anymore, it's just annoying. So remember that. Okay, let's look at how this works though. So the first element is actually like the folding animation that I wanna look at. And so here I have what appears to be an image. Um, if I rotate it, it still appears to be an image, but it's actually three images. And what I've done here is that each of these containers has the full image, but I'm setting, a, I'm constraining the height. So let's say the max height is 200 pixels, and then I'm adding overflow hidden. This mouse over effect that I'm doing, all that actually is doing is removing overflow hidden so that we see what the contents are. And so the trick is that this middle container is shifted down by the height of the first one, let's say 200 pixels, and then its children are shifted up by, so it's the inverse transform, so it's going up by 200 pixels instead. And when we do that, it's just about applying animation to the containers, because the containers, while they include the whole image, they also include the children that are just being cropped. Um, so this is like, it's a cool trick, and it's just a matter of CSS transforms once you structure it this way. Okay, let's look at a component for how we do this. Um, we need to know if the thing is folded or not. The children are like the actual thing that we wanna fold, and then we need a duration, which we're gonna default to a second. 
In our render method, we're doing kind of two things. We're rendering the original, and then if the folding animation is currently running, we're rendering a folded copy. In our render original, um, we're actually just rendering children, but we're wrapping it in a div for two reasons. Um, the first is that we want to get a reference to the node, and the other is that we want to hide the original copy once the folding animation starts. So once that starts, we can use the original node that we've captured to get the position on screen using get bounding client rect. How many people have worked, have used get bounding client rect before? Okay, about half. Um, for those who don't, aren't familiar, what it does is it tells you where on the screen an element is. So it gives you the coordinates of that element from the top left corner. So top is gonna be the number of pixels from the top, left is the number of pixels from the left. It also gives you the size of the actual child. And so we can use that to apply that to a style to the wrapper. So that our original thing is here, our folded copy is gonna be like positioned in exactly the same place. And so when the folding starts, we're doing this like hot swap. We're quickly, because don't forget, we're like setting opacity of the original to zero. So it's hidden and then we only have our folded copy. Um, then we have this chunk of code and I've actually hidden a bunch of props. It like really was unsightly. Um, but the thing to realize is that this top fold eventually has the children, the same children that we're rendering up here. Um, so that's our top fold. Our middle fold has exactly the same thing and our bottom fold has the same thing. So we're rendering the same child three times in each of these containers. Um, and that's kind of it, right? Like you all understand how this works now, kind of. I mean, not really, because I'm neglecting to mention the CSS keyframe animation or the other animation or this CSS or this CSS or this CSS or a lot of CSS. Um, it, it is worth saying that this CSS is not like, there's nothing like super special about this CSS. It's not like, you don't have to worry about browser compatibility. It's like your grandmother's CSS. It's nothing modern or like wild. Um, but there's a lot of it and it's tricky. CSS is hard. Um, but the nice thing about React and components is that we don't have to worry about that. Like we've solved the problem, we're encapsulating it into component, and now we can just focus on making a really nice API to access that bit of CSS. So let's see how we use it. I have this modal here, which like or the composing mill component we can think of as the modal. It's gonna have a status of either composing or sending. We have an action to update that status. And then like look at how nice this is. We just have a foldable component and we don't need to track its state separately because whether or not it's folded is just dependent on our business logic, right? If we're in the middle of composing it, then it's not folded and when we click send, that action fires, send letter, which changes the state, which means that the folding animation starts. And then the children is just the letter, the thing that we need to fold. Okay, the next problem I wanna look at is moving nodes around on the screen. And so this is like the MVP, the React Storybook, like just testing the idea, playing with it. And so what I want is when I click on a button, the children pops out. When I click on a different pop, uh, element, it like moves to the center and shrinks. So there's like two pieces I need for this to work. One is that I need the node context, which is just a way of figuring out where things are on the screen. And the next is I need this transport component, which is gonna orchestrate the motion from one spot to another. I'd like to start with the node context. And so to understand why this is a problem and what the, like what the problem is, I have these two nodes that I care about. I have like the outbox heading and I have the compose button, but they're not siblings. Um, and so they're, it's like they're separated in the DOM tree. And so one way we could solve this is the traditional way. Like we could use jQuery or we could use document query selector and then we could pass it a class name or like maybe a data attribute. And then once we have that, we can call get bounding client rect, our friend from just before, to figure out where it is on the screen. Um, and this actually, like, I don't hate on this method as much as I thought I would. Um, it's still like, it's, it's considered bad just because it's all happening outside of React's purview. And so, like, if we do this in a component, we don't have any way of knowing if the DOM changes. So if this button ceases to exist, we're not gonna automatically re-render. So what we want is to be able to have this data through props. And so this is where React's new context API comes in. Um, so we'll look at it briefly how it works, but I wanna look at how we consume it first. So I have this provider, which works kind of the same way as a Redux provider. We just wrap it at the top of our app and that makes this secret context stuff available. Um, then we have like a node that we care about. So we have this other part of it, the node consumer, and we can expose a ref capturer function. And so that function, we're gonna give it a name of the thing that we're capturing. And then this function is gonna return another function that can be used to capture the reference to the element. And so the point of this is that we've decided we care about this H4 over here. And so we're gonna capture a reference to it and we're gonna give it a name of outbox heading. Meanwhile, whoops, I didn't actually go through that. Um, somewhere else in our application, we need that outbox heading. And so we have this nodes object made available by the node consumer. And we can just use like nodes.outbox heading. And of course, when that component appears, this is gonna re-render. And when it disappears, it's also gonna re-render and it's not gonna be defined anymore. 
Um, if we look at how this works, so this is just using the React 16 context API. Uh, I'm not going to dive into it in too much detail, um, but effectively we create a context and then the stuff that we're making available is this nodes object. It's just a plain old JavaScript object, but it has the form of a map. And then we have the capture function, which takes an ID, which returns a function that we can use to actually like set our state to have this new node merged into the existing nodes. Uh, and then we export the consumer that will have access to that stuff. Okay, um, the next part of this is the transport component. And I realized that this transport component is actually like kind of hairy, uh, and there, because there's all these little edge cases, but I think rather than dive into the code, because you know, I'm running a little bit short on time, um, I think it'd be more valuable just to look at what I want the API to look like and to see how we'd use it, and also to talk about the underlying mechanics. Um, but so what it looks like is this. We have a, a transport component, which is gonna have a from node and a to node, and these are just HTML elements captured with the node context stuff. Um, we also have a status. In this case, our only statuses are open and closed. Uh, and so this is a matter of like, when the status goes from closed to open, it's gonna pop out from the from node, and when the status goes from open to closed, it's gonna do the transporting to the to node. And then the children is just the actual like thing that we're moving around, the modal or whatever. And so I think we have kind of all the pieces that we need to put this together now. So we have this button that we care about and using node context, we can figure out that it's let's say 800 pixels from the left and only like five pixels from the top. Then we have our child, which we can also work out is like whatever, 550 from the left and maybe 60 from the top. These numbers probably don't add up, don't pay them too much attention. Um, we can also capture the size of the child. And then finally, our target, like the two node, we might say is 75 pixels from the left and 10 from the top. And so then we have this child, which we know the size, and we know that we want it to go kind of like from this area to this area. And so then we can just do the math. So we might know that the center position of this node to the center position of that node is let's say 675 pixels to the left, and it's 210 to the top. And so that's the transform we can apply. We can just add a CSS transform that moves at that amount, and we can also set the scale from one to zero. And so if we can work all that stuff out because we have access to the nodes, this actually becomes a manageable problem. Okay, let's look at how all of this works together. So this is our old friend, the compose email modal. Um, it has the same state as before, the same action. In our render method, we're gonna return the node consumer, which receives the two nodes that we care about in this like limited example, the compose button that is our to or from, and the outbox heading, which is our to. Then we have our new transport component, which receives those two nodes, as from as to, as from and to. And it also receives a status, which is, again, based on the domain logic that we already have. So if the status is composing, that means that we want this to be open, because that means the user's like actively writing the email. And when they click send, the status goes to something else, so transport can close. Um, as children, this is unchanged from before. This is the same foldable logic. And so what's really cool about building things this way is that you wind up with these modular pieces that you can just put together and they don't have to know anything about each other. Like transport can just transport whatever you give it and foldable can just fold whatever you get it. Um, there is like, this is a slight oversimplification because actually we want these things to happen sequentially. Like we want it to fold and then transport, but the solution for that is just to add another status and then have this have like an on finish callback. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, I think that the world needs more whimsy. It's like a dark world out there and we should be trying to make our users smile. Like this is beneficial, right? I like smiling, who doesn't? Um, there's also like maybe surprisingly a business case for this. So I'd like to talk about Patreon. So Patreon had this, uh, they wrote this article about how they improved their activation by 100%, which is like unheard of in growth, right? Like that's, they doubled it, which is wild. And they did a bunch of stuff, so I don't wanna like put too much emphasis on this, but one of the things they did is they added custom confetti that would fire when the creator finally launches their campaign, because you made it through the onboarding and now you get to celebrate. Um, and incidentally, we did something very similar at Khan Academy. So when the user gets all of the questions right in a sequence, we rain confetti down on the screen. You may not think this is a very big deal, but we know that it is because for a while it broke in Firefox and we got a lot of angry emails from parents <laughs> wondering where their confetti was. Another thing I'd like to talk about is Domino's Pizza. Domino's friggin' pizza, right? Um, they added this thing to the end of when you order a pizza. I'm in Canada, so by default it was hockey themed. Um, but normally in the States and elsewhere, you have Pete the pizza maker. Thank you for ordering Domino's. Stay tuned and I'll show you exactly how we make your meal here at your local Domino's. 
And oh boy, does he ever. He goes on for like, I've cut it here, but he goes on for minutes talking about how the pizza works. Whenever your, your pizza gets to the next step, he talks about exactly what that means. He wanders around in the back. It's interactive. You can click on the boxes and they rustle. You can click on the pizza paddle and Pete, the pizza maker says, ah, the pizza paddle. And he talks about that for a little bit. Um, <laughs> so it's this like really charming experience. And it actually makes me think that like, in most cases you have loading times of under a second. Earlier in this talk, we looked at our whimsical My Guppy project and the, the planet and the file. And that's like a wait time of like 30 or 40 seconds. Domino's has a load time of 30 or 40 minutes while they're like getting the pizza to you. <laughs> and so they really have to come up with something to like keep you busy during that time. Um, and you might think this doesn't matter, that like this is just some quirky thing from this, un, this like mildly popular pizza chain. Domino's friggin' pizza is growing faster than Amazon, faster than Apple, faster than Facebook, faster than Google. This is their stock price over time. Domino's pizza is like the fastest growing company out there. Um, and their, their CEO attributes their growth to two things. One is they mentioned they made their pizza taste better, which obviously that helps. Um, but they also started thinking about themselves as a tech company and working on the user experience through things like the pizza tracker. Um, so this stuff actually makes a big difference. Okay, I'd also like to talk a little bit about the ecosystem of tools out there. Because you might think that like, this stuff is all really hard to do. And I've kind of made the mistake of doing everything from scratch myself, which is, it's like valuable because you learn how to do it. But there is these tools that we should be taking advantage of. And one of them is called React Spring. Anyone heard of React Spring? Cool, it's quite a few people. Um, it's similar to React Motion in that it's just the spring physics, but there's all these like wild demos because they keep adding, the author keeps adding these like additional things that it can do. And it's really impressive. Um, another really cool tool is called Pose. And Pose is this like rich library of React components. Um, I think it actually works outside of React 2, but there's bindings. And it does a whole bunch of stuff. Like it allows you to orchestrate parent-child animations among a bunch of other things. Um, a third thing I'd like to talk about is React Flip Toolkit, which like watch this demo. It's one of the most wild demos I've ever seen. So things shuffle around. You can reorganize what the structure looks like and all the elements change. You can click on them and those elements move where they need to and the others fade in and they shuffle around as you click on them. It's like this thing that would be so much work if you had to do this from scratch and there are tools that just like help you do this. It's wild. I'd also like to throw a shout out to um, Alex and Mateus from these libraries because I wonder if this will work. Let's see if it'll work. Yeah, they helped, they recreated my transport thing using these tools. Um, and there's like not that much code. So definitely these tools are worthwhile. Uh, what did I do? How do I go back? Oh no, I've broken my presentation. Okay, good. Back on track. Um, despite the fact that we have these tools, there's still a lot of unexplored territory that we really should be exploring. So, like, for example, I needed a circle a while ago, but I wanted the circle to be wobbly like this. I wanted it to be like a bubble floating on the wind. And believe it or not, there's no NPM library I can install to get this. Um, and it was a hard thing to solve. I had to use Bezier curves and uh, it was true. So, like, it'd be really cool if we did have a richer library of, like, specific concrete things like this so that when someone else has the problem, they don't have to solve it themselves. So there's a ton of room. Like, you know, I used to think that, like, all of the problems are, have either been solved by someone else or the problems are so hard that people have tried and failed and someone like me would have no chance of solving them. It's not actually true. Like there's a bunch of just things that no one has done yet that are like ripe for the picking. So I also think that like there's so much exciting stuff coming in terms of like the platform. Um, anyone heard of CSS Houdini? Well, okay, that's like 10% of the room, if that. Um, CSS Houdini is like a series of things coming to CSS and there's like, it's gonna allow you to define your own layouts, which is gonna be really exciting. Um, but I'd like to talk about paint. And so what paint is, is you define a class that has a paint method, and then it receives a context. And this is very similar to like an HTML5 context. It's like a drawing system. It also receives the size of the element and any CSS variables. Um, and what this allows you to do is you can then apply like JavaScript as anywhere that takes uh, like a URL or an image you can pass paint now and pass it a specific painter that you register like this. Um, and this allows you to do a bunch of things. So like these underline effects are all done just by applying a CSS property once you've written this worklet. Um, these checkboxes don't look like much, but this is a native checkbox. You're able to style native form elements now. So that's exciting, good and accessible. Um, you can do like material design's uh, ripple effect with no pseudo elements or extra divs. It's just part of the button now. Um, there's this cool thing where you can tweak using CSS variables and tweak like the separation between units or between elements. Um, and this is just like scratching the surface. 
There's this uh, site that has a bunch of demos that I think are really cool. Highly recommend checking it out. But these are like early days. Like it's supported in Chrome, but I don't think it's supported in other browsers yet. But they're all working on it. Uh, and when it comes around, it's going to open up how much we can do. And there's a bunch of like really cool React components we can build that encapsulate this behavior. Um, I'd like to quickly stop and say that like I'm talking about things that actually aren't that important. Um, they're important. I think they're good. But they're not as important as accessibility, right? Like we should really be focusing on making sure that the things that we're building can be used by a lot of people, people that have, uh, like, that aren't using a mouse, for example, or people that have issues with color. Uh, and I think all of that is so much more important than what I'm talking about. So please don't get too carried away with what I'm talking about if your site still needs to be uh, made accessible. Um, I think one thing that's really important to focus on as well, especially with this kind of stuff, is making sure that there's a way to disable animations. Um, and the reason this is important is that people can have, so there's this category of issues called vestibular disorders. And the vestibular system, as I understand it, has to do with the inner ear and regulating balance. So people that have vestibular disorders have trouble, they have like vertigo issues and they become easily sick with like motion. So if we have like our confetti raining, that's fun, but it might make some of our users feel sick and that's bad. So how do we solve this? Well, there's a media query called prefers reduced motion. And because it's a media query, we can access it in JavaScript. And I would really, really like to tell you that this was all you had to do, um, but I can't say that because the uh, browser support is awful. Um, and the reason for that is that it's actually a Mac OS operating system setting that Safari has integrated. Um, but it's part of the operating system, and it looks like Firefox is working on it, which is exciting, uh, but no one else is. So the way we solve this at Khan Academy is that we just have a property on our user model that we can access in the settings so that a user can actually like, click a checkbox. Uh, and then we check both that and the media query. Um, okay, so that's all really important, and I really hope that that's the, the main takeaway. But to quickly summarize the other stuff that I've been talking about, um, it's getting really easy to create really delightful experiences because there's this amazing ecosystem of tools, and the platform continues to improve. So I think that there's really like so much opportunity to build wonderful, whimsical animations, and we're just starting with this stuff. Like, there's so much we haven't done yet. So if this interests you, come help us build it. Um, all right, that's my talk. Thanks so much.